Welcome to the Thursday Night Photo Talks, our second one. Um, I'm very excited uh, that Daniela Zalkman is joining us here tonight. The Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, along with every cultural organization in, in probably the world, um, has to make, um, continue to connect with our community online and um, and build community and, and actually um, through the help of these wonderful speakers that are gonna be giving a lecture every Thursday night, we're broadening our, our community as well. We can, we can actually invite artists who are in Las Vegas um, <laughs> and to speak to um, our community. Uh, and so I just wanted to welcome, welcome everybody. Daniela Zaltman is a Vietnamese American documentary photographer based in Paris and New York and currently stationed in Las Vegas. Um, she is a multiple grantee of the Pulitzer Crisis Center on Crisis Reporting, a fellow with the International Women's Media Fund Foundation, a National Geographic Society grantee, and the founder of the Women Photograph, an initiative working to elevate the voices of women and non-binary visual journalists. Her work tends to focus on the legacies of Western colonization from the rise of homophobia in East Africa to the forced assimilation education of indigenous children in North America. Her ongoing project, Signs of I Your Identity, is the recipient of the 2017 Arnold Newman Prize, a 2017 Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, the 2016 Photo Evidence Book Award, the 2016 Magnum Foundation's Inge Morath Award, and part of the Open Society Foundation's Moving Walls 24. Um, we're very, very happy uh, to have you here, Daniela. I'm so excited to hear about this project and your work. Um, and with that, I would just like to say um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. And hi, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, a couple small things before I start talking about my work and signs of your identity. Um, the first is that there are a couple images of injection drug use and some text references to sexual assault in my presentation. Um, Normally I say that to a live audience and say to students if they need to. Presentation and then uh, it should be two text references. So just as a, a heads up for everyone. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I, uh, this is also a more complicated thing to do when people are all over, but I personally am currently sitting, standing, on the traditional territory of the Southern Paiute. Uh, for those of you who are in Philadelphia, you are currently on the traditional territory of the Lenape. Um, when I started working in Canada and Australia, I encountered a lot of public events, government events, uh, where land acknowledgements to, to acknowledge the indigenous people who had historically stewarded the land that we now occupy, um, to, to acknowledge that. And I think it's high time that we start doing the same thing in the United States. Um, if you are not in either Las Vegas or Philadelphia and you are curious about whose historical lands you occupy, you can look at a website called native-land.ca. Um, I'll type that into the chat. Um, uh, and so you can, you can look up uh, whose lands you, you currently are occupying. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to try to do this over chat and I, I won't torture all of you into interactive um, versions of this talk beyond that. But before I start, before I get into the particular history that I've looked at for the past five or so years, I want to ask all of you. So this is, this is a talk that I normally give to middle school and high school students throughout the United States. And I probably, I would say in the past four or five years have spoken to about three or 400 uh, classrooms. And I always start out by asking students, what are your primary associations with Native Americans in the U.S.? And so I'm, I'm maybe not asking all of you for your primary associations, but maybe if you think back to your 12-year-old self, or you think to some of the more common associations maybe your, your children, your grandchildren might have, I'm curious for those of you who are currently in this Zoom, what, what you think that I, I get three answers in almost every single classroom wherever I am in the US. And I'm, I'm curious if anyone has guesses as to what those three things might be. I'm monitoring the chat, if anyone wants to give it a shot and type in some guesses. Uh, so I'm thinking to give you, to narrow it down, I'm thinking of sort of three specific references to individuals, 
to I've seen um, I'm seeing a lot of things that do come up a lot. So Cowboys and Indians, Cigar Store Indians, the Redskins, John Wayne, Tonto. I'm thinking of, so I'll, I'll narrow it down a little because you're not genocide. That should be our first association often. Um, I'm thinking of a person who featured heavily in a children's movie that many of us probably watched when we were kids. Someone got, so Pocahontas is one. Another is a holiday that we all celebrate every year. Thanksgiving. And then the third is someone who is not himself indigenous, but somehow often gets roped into the story of indigenous people in the Americas and also has become, uh, and Columbus Day, exactly. So those are the three things. Every single classroom I go into in the United States, when I ask students, what do you, what do you first associate with indigenous people? I almost always get Pocahontas, Christopher Columbus, Thanksgiving as the responses. And obviously there's a huge problem with that, right? Because those are three real historical people events, but the versions that we know and share today continually in our history books in popular culture are, are pretty deeply bastardized from what, what the true version of the story is, right? You know, the children's movie that I definitely watched as a kid, the Disney version of Pocahontas, that was theoretically a love story or at least a relationship that happened in real life. John Smith, was his life was rescued by a young woman who was native, whose name was Pocahontas. But in real life, she was 12 years old at the time when she was in a relationship with him. So it kind of changes the framework of, of that romance. Christopher Columbus, we continue to, we assign an epithet to him continually in our history textbooks that he was the person responsible for discovering the new world, for discovering the United States which is a very odd word to continue to use when there were already millions of people occupying the Americas. And then Thanksgiving, you know, this lovely story that we tell each other when we gather with our families around the dinner table every November and eat a lot of turkey and watch football. The thing that we leave out of that story of a bunch of settlers from Europe coming to this new land and not really being able to take care of themselves or fend for themselves and some, you know, being essentially taken in and supported by indigenous people who already lived there and taught how to hunt and fed, that meal actually took place the day after a genocide where 30 native men were hung in a square in Massachusetts and kind of changes the tenor of, of the dinner that happened the next day. And so, you know, I want, as I sort of progress through this project for all of us to think about, you know, what, why is it that certain versions of our own histories get shifted and retold and forgotten, um, sometimes because it makes us feel more comfortable with who we are and, and what America represents. Um, so on that note, I am going to share my screen. Oh, Lori, we're having the, the same issue we had earlier where I'm not a, allowed to share my screen. Try now, Daniela. There we go, perfect. All right, keynote. Share. Can everyone see my screen? Thumbs up if you can see it. Great. All right. Um, so this is a project that I sort of inadvertently, or rather a history that I stumbled across uh, in 2014. Um, I, my background is I'm a documentary photographer. Uh, I got my start as a newspaper photographer in New York City, mostly for the New York Daily News and the Wall Street Journal, uh, and about five years into doing that work, which I absolutely loved and am really grateful for. I, I did start to understand that what I was best at and what I connected to most with photography was really investing my time into intimate interactions with people and getting to know their stories, their histories, their families. And with newspapers, you know, the, the best and worst thing about a newspaper is that it has to come out every single day and you have to produce work every single day. And so my assignments on average lasted from 15 minutes to three hours. And that, that started to become taxing to me that I would form these close bonds with people I was meeting and photographing. And then I would just have to up and move on to the next thing. And I really, I wanted to be able to work in, in a much slower, much more long form way. So one of the first projects I worked on looked at the rise of homophobia in East Africa and specifically the ways in which that's tied to Western colonialism and British penal codes that were left behind in the 1950s. And because of that project, circuitously, I, I ended up in Australia at this HIV conference. And while I was there, I happened to read a single line in a UN report that referenced the fact that the demographic in the world with the fastest growing rate of HIV was actually First Nations Canadians, Indigenous Canadians. 
And I have no background in public health. I studied architecture in college. I'm a journalist. I don't know all that much about HIV and its spread, but it still, it, it made very little sense to me. Canada has a pretty robust healthcare system. It's certainly better than America's. It's nationalized. You, generally speaking, have cheap or free access to medicine and hospitals and doctors, which is perhaps as it should be. Um, sorry to get political. Um, and yet there was this massive epidemic. In a 10-year period from 2004 to 2014, the HIV rates among Indigenous people in Canada went up by more than 25%, which is unheard of. We think about the height of the HIV crisis, and we tend to think about Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Asia and Latin America. And these are parts of the world where HIV infection rates are going down every single year. We have more or less figured out how to manage it, if not cure it. And yet there, there was this huge problem. And so I, I wrote a grant application to the Pulitzer Center and I spent about a month in Canada in British Columbia, Ontario and Saskatchewan interviewing HIV positive First Nations people. And almost every single person I talked to told me about their time in something called Indian residential school. And I unfortunately can't see all of your faces in this interface, so I can't do an informal poll. I'd be curious to know how many of you have heard of Indian boarding schools or Indian residential schools before. I can tell you that I had never heard of the system before. I had never read about it, learned about it in any of my high school or university level classes. Hello? Hello, hello. Oh, you can. I'm sorry, my, my computer is going nuts and it's not allowing me to look. Uh... You're, you're, you are back. Okay, great, perfect, sorry. Oh, um, I've lost control of my computer somehow. I don't really know why. Sorry. Um, so, in the 1870s, the Canadian government created this network of boarding schools that were made mandatory by law. So a government employee called an Indian agent would show up on native reservations in indigenous communities and would effectively kidnap all of the children under the age of 15, sometimes as young as two years old. And once they were taken, they were sent to these boarding schools where they were told that they would not be allowed to speak their languages or practice their cultures in any capacity their hair was cut off, there was routine physical and sexual assaults, there was medical testing performed on many of these students, there were a lot of young women who were sterilized. And we tend to think about the arc of the oppression of indigenous people in the Americas as something that happened hundreds of years ago, right? We, I think, probably tend to think of, thing, think of things like Wounded Knee and the Trail of Tears and the Indian Wars. But the last boarding school in Canada closed in 1996. Um, which I'm imagining, since this is not a middle school audience, is actually within the lifespan of almost everyone on this call. It's certainly within my lifespan. I met a young woman who was born the year I was born, 1986, and was taken away from her family and sent to one of these boarding schools. So in theory, had I been born in Saskatchewan and been First Nations, there is a chance that I could have been taken away as well. So in the course of this first trip in starting to learn about these boarding schools, I met this young woman named Ellie, um, who you can see on your screen right now. And she's, she's about my age uh, and she's HIV positive and she's an injection drug user, which for HIV positive indigenous people in Canada, um, injection drug use is the primary route, uh, the primary way through HIV is spread. Um, she's a sometimes sex worker, she's an alcoholic, she's dealing with a lot of very complicated issues in her life. And while she didn't go to boarding school herself, both of her parents and all four of her grandparents and every single one of her aunts and uncles did. And so she's starting to tell me about their experiences and she's sharing with me this boarding school system that I've really never heard of before. And I'm starting to just understand what exactly the system means and the incredible impact it's had on the entire indigenous community. But I'm also, I'm there as a photojournalist and my training is as a news photographer. I photograph the things that are in front of me. And so, you know, I start to make images of Ellie and her family and they're photos that look like this. Um, and, you know, these are photographs that are a completely 
real accurate depiction of her reality and her family's reality and the things they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I got home after this month of reporting and I realized that I couldn't publish any of these photos. The, fundamentally, this was poor journalism, that it did very little to actually illuminate what I was starting to learn was the bigger story, the bigger arc behind this one little public health statistic that I had learned. And that it would be both a huge disservice to this family that had trusted me with their time and their stories and their space to, to essentially portray them in a way that so much of Canadian media and American media has portrayed Indigenous people in, in really stigmatizing unnecessary ways. And so I went back to the Pulitzer Center and I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I messed up. I, I didn't totally understand the story. And you know, we could have an entire talk on, on the strength and the differences between having insiders and outsiders work in journalism. But I said, look, I, I got it wrong. I didn't understand the first time what the story really was. And I need to go back and I need to try again. And I, I think, unfortunately, photography as a medium isn't quite good enough for the story that I actually think I need to tell. And so fortunately, the Pulitzer Center said, OK, fine, whatever. We don't really understand what you're saying, but here, go. Um, and I, I went back. And, and this is one of the first photos I took when I returned a year later. Um, and this is actually a cemetery in a boarding school in Regina, Saskatchewan. Um, so when I'm talking to middle school students, I say, you know, I, I want you guys to imagine that so many of your classmates are dying at school, that your school has a cemetery out back, because that's what many of these boarding schools had. Um, just so you can have a sense of the distribution of these schools throughout Canada. Um, I don't know how easy it is for you to see, but the yellow squares uh, show all of the schools that were open. So essentially every single province except for Prince Edwards Island um, and as far north as the Arctic Circle and Baffin Island. Um, and I don't think you can see my mouse, unfortunately, but where I ended up returning to a year later was the province of Saskatchewan. So Plains province dead in the middle of Canada, sort of due north of Montana, North Dakota. Uh, and sort of in the south center part of Saskatchewan is a school called Gordon's, uh, which is the last one that closed in the, in the country in 1996. So I had this challenge. Um, you know, I had found something that seemed to be an incredibly important, largely untold part of our collective history in North America. And I had started out by photographing something that felt like a symptom or an effect of this much bigger structural thing, this form of cultural genocide. And that felt like a failure to me. And I couldn't really photograph in the schools anymore because the last one closed in the 1990s, even though there are uh, uh, 80,000 indigenous Canadians still alive who passed through the school system. And so I realized I needed to come up with a different visual language to use to tell this story. So when I returned, I decided that what I would do is I would create double exposure portraits of First Nations Canadians who had gone to these boarding schools. And I sat down with people who had attended, I interviewed them, I took their portrait, and then based on our conversation, I went in search of a secondary image, um, usually at the exact site of where that person had attended boarding school. In many cases, I ended up having to be a little more figurative. Uh, but with Valerie, this is one of the last uh, boarding schools still standing in Saskatchewan uh, in the 70s, 80s, and then in the 90s when all of them were eventually handed back over to tribal control. A lot of Native communities decided you know, we don't want any trace of these buildings left in our communities on our reserves. So we're going to, you know, we're going to demolish them. We're going to burn them to the ground. Um, but in Valerie's case, the Muskaugan Residential School is still standing. So this is actually a broken window in the building where she was a student as a young child. She's one of quite a few people I interviewed who lived in reasonably remote communities in the northern part of the province, which is very sparsely populated. And she grew up only speaking her language, only speaking Cree. And she was taken away by force as a young kid and she was sent to this boarding school and she was beaten every time she spoke Cree until she learned English and could speak English fluently. And six years later, she had effectively forgotten how to speak her language because she wasn't allowed to return home over winter break, over summer break. And so when she returned six years later to her community, she only spoke English and her family only spoke Cree and she couldn't communicate with her parents anymore. This is a gentleman named Gary who passed through three different boarding schools in Saskatchewan, um, suffering horrible abuses at all three. Uh, and the strongest memory he has um, that 
in this image, I was trying to recreate actually a, a memory he described to me of what he could see out the window of the church windows when he was in service every single morning. But he told me the story of every single Monday, the priest taking after service, he would take out this chain and would padlock the church doors and then would put on one of those World War I era canister gas masks and would start unscrewing what looked like empty mason jars. And after a few minutes, kids would start throwing up and would start having nosebleeds and sometimes would have small seizures. And he can't substantiate this. And I've worked hard to do it, but it's difficult because the Canadian government's destroyed about half of the records to do with boarding school. But he believes that the school is testing nerve gas on young children. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes this woman's face. Um, this woman's name is Serafina. She's uh, Ellie's aunt, the aunt of the young woman I first mentioned I connected with. But if I can just, ooh, this will go slowly. Um, but that's Serafina there in the middle of that sofa. So, you know, two incredibly different ways to show someone photographically, um, two different ways to tell a story. And I, th I think we probably can all agree on which one is, is more respectful and more meaningful. Um, there's a photo editor at the New York Times I used to work with quite a bit who once told me that when he was considering what photo he wanted to run on the lead, on the front page of the New York Times the next morning, he always asked himself, would I be comfortable with my mother being represented in this way? And it's kind of a funny metric if you stop to think about it. But at the same time, I think, you know, what, what if we all considered people on the front pages of newspapers and instead of thinking of them as being so far away while they're experiencing war or famine or whatever horrible thing we're choosing to highlight that morning, you know, what if, what if we thought of those individuals as instead as part of our family? I think it would very much change our relationship to the news and the way we consume the news. Um, in Rick's case, this is one of many times where I spoke to him. Um, I went in search of something to use in the composite and there was just absolutely nothing. I went up to the Capel Valley, which is where he'd gone to school. And I spoke to people who were in the community and I asked, you know, is there anything left of the school? A plaque, a, a memorial, a cornerstone, anything. And they said, no, you know, we, we got rid of everything. We just, we didn't want a single trace left of that school. And so I got back in my car and I was driving back down towards the city where I was staying. And I saw, you know, maybe 10 miles south of the town, this little cemetery off the side of the highway in, in some woods. And I went down to take a look. And in the very back corner, there were these six headstones and they were all in French and they were all four children who died when they were about seven or eight years old. So I think it's, you know, that part of Canada was never French speaking, but that school had been run by French Catholic priests and nuns. So I think it's reasonable to assume that those were all students at Rick's school. I think it's always important for all of us. I'm, I'm guessing many of the people on this, uh, listening to this talk are in some capacity documentarians, photographers themselves. And I think it's always important for us to think about what it means when we're interviewing and photographing and talking to people who've experienced severe trauma. Um, and the biggest problem is that, you know, journalists are often on the front lines of some of the most traumatic events in human history. Um, and unfortunately, we're not always the best equipped to be talking to people who've experienced severe trauma. You know, we're not social workers, we're not therapists, we're, we're not always the best people to be listening to first disclosures of sexual assault, of, of conflict, whatever the case may be. Um, and I'm, I'm the same, I, I have those same weaknesses as well. But one thing that I tried to do to make sure that I was being responsible and safe was to very clearly state to people, look, you do not have to, I'm not asking you to dig up any memories that you're not willing to talk about. You can share as little or as much with me as you would like. And for most of the people I interviewed, you know, our conversations probably lasted for two to three hours. Because I think for many of us, that's partially how we heal, right? Is, is telling stories and getting things off our chest and sharing. That's why we go see psychologists. That's why we talk to people who we care about. But we all cope and we all heal with trauma. We all deal with trauma in very different ways. And so for Elwood, he came to me, he wanted to be photographed. He wanted to be part of the project. But when I went to sit down to talk with him, all he said to me, the only thing he wanted to share was, I've never told anyone what went on there. It's shameful. I am ashamed. I'll never tell anyone and I've done everything to try to forget. And I think in its own way, that's equally powerful. Um, I'm trying to be mindful of time, so I might speed through some of these a little bit. Um, many of these boarding schools were built 
along natural barriers to prevent students from escaping. Um, I don't think I said this earlier, but 150,000 First Nations Canadians were sent to these schools. 80,000 of them are still alive today. And about 8,000 are recorded as having died while in school. Uh, and that number is absolutely way too low because in the 1920s, the Canadian government told the school administrators, you can stop keeping track. We don't actually need to keep records of that. Um, so we are still today discovering unmarked and mass graves behind schools that were never accounted for. Um, Selena went to school along the banks of the Beaver River um, and had several classmates die because they were trying to run away and drowned. We can always talk about how systems of oppression lead into other systems of oppression. So, you know, in the United States, slavery turned into the modern prison system. In Canada, boarding school gave way to foster care instead. So, you know, in the 70s or in the 60s, really, which was sort of the start of the boarding schools being closed. Instead of the Canadian government taking First Nations children from their parents and sending them to boarding schools, the Canadian government started taking First Nations children from their parents and sending them to foster homes. Um, and in theory, the foster care system is meant to do good, is meant to serve children who are in complicated, unstable environments and put them somewhere safer. But a vast majority of Indigenous children who were taken and put in the foster care system had homes, had parents, had no need to be removed from their families and were anyway. I always end on Rosalie's story um, when I'm talking to students and sort of say, okay, so now, now that we've gone through this arc, um, you know, Rosalie talks about the fact that she was sexually assaulted as a young child, the fact that that directly led to her being an alcoholic, that forgiveness and trauma and all of these things are, are very tied up in each other. And I say to students, you know, do you guys maybe think differently now about those first photos that I showed you of Ellie and her family and the things that they were experiencing in part due to what they went through when they went to boarding school. And students always go, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I say, but do you think it would have been responsible for me to share those images if I wasn't able to also give this accompanying 20 minute talk about all of these histories and these stories? And they go, oh, no, 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 no. And I, I think that's something that all of us have to think about whether we're photographers or amateurs or we're just people with Instagram accounts because all of us now are capable of being content creators and publishers in our own right because of social media, right? And you know, I think it's incredibly important that we remember that we say that a picture is worth a thousand words and in many ways I agree with that, but words are also important and words are context and meaning that we can't always convey. And if we don't know how our images are going to be shared, if they're going to be taken out of the context in which we originally meant for them to be consumed, what happens and what do we lose? And that was the thing that worried me most about those first photos that I made was, you know, not only were they stigmatizing, but, but at, at worst, what happens if people were looking at them not knowing that I was going to say, well, look, Ellie's parents and grandparents and everyone in her family had this horrible, traumatic experience. They went through something that is essentially genocide, and that's where they are today. If I can't do that, if I can't pop out of a newspaper or a magazine and also give this talk, it's, it's not responsible of me to publish those images. So in some way, this secondary technique that I turned to was a way to avoid that and, and to attempt to sort of rescue my images from that fate. So I started this project in Canada and that was probably easier for me because I didn't have to deal with the nationalistic shame of what my government did to people in my country. But the truth is the United States actually invented the boarding school system. And the more I started to read and research, the more I learned. And the first Indian boarding school was actually created by a US Army general named Pratt. It was in Pennsylvania, it was called Carlisle. And the United States to this day has 59 Indian boarding schools still operating. Um, they are very different from what they once were. They are no longer explicitly meant to eradicate indigenous culture and suppress native identity, but they are still pretty terrible places often. They are still the sites where current students, parents and grandparents were horribly mistreated. And there's a lot of accountability that has just not been addressed yet. And unfortunately, one of the reasons why many of those schools continue to exist is because the United States government does not provide infrastructure and does not feel like it has as much of a legal responsibility to native reservations, to native communities as they do to other American citizens and you know, Native Americans are tax paying US citizens just like the rest of us. And yet there are often substandard roads and school buses and public schools and running water in a lot of native spaces. So that is one of the reason why many of the institutions that you see 
<clears throat> that these individuals attended are still running today. If you live in a community, it's, it's often presented as a choice now that you, you can send your child to boarding school if you want to. But if you live in the Navajo reservation in Big Navajo and you're more than a two hour drive from the closest public school, it's not really a choice. So I started this work in the Southwest um, in Big Navajo, which is the largest reservation uh, in the United States. And then I met a Lakota elder there. And so I ended up in the plains um, in Lakota territory. And after about a month reporting there, so uh, that was uh, July, August of uh, 2017, um, Towards the end of my last interview, uh, I, I met, or the end of my trip, I met a gentleman who'd been part of the American Indian Movement, um, which for those of you who are unfamiliar is sort of the civil rights movement that paralleled the Black Power Movement uh, in the 60s and 70s. And he said, look, there's gonna be this protest starting tomorrow. I think it'll be important. I think you can probably take some cool photos. You should come with me and, and be there. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I've actually, I've got some interviews lined up in a reservation in Eastern Montana called Crow Nation. I really, I have to, it's quite a long drive from South Dakota, so I, I have to go, I'm so sorry, but you know, let me know how it goes. I, I wish you well. And I got in my car and I drove about eight hours to Montana and I checked into a motel and I started reading about the Dakota Access Pipeline for those of you who remember that conflict. And I went, God damn it. And I got back in my rental car and I drove back uh, to North Dakota to, you know, very close to where I had just been. Um, and the next morning I was uh, on scene for essentially the start of construction and the start of the protests in Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and so I often ask students, you know, if we change the fact that Greg Greycloud in the front here is wearing blue jeans and we change the uniform of the North Dakota State Police, could this photo have been taken a hundred years ago? And I think the answer is very much yes, because this is more or less the exact same thing that indigenous people in the Lakota in particular have been fighting since settlers, since Europeans showed up on North American soil. Um, you know, the Lakota became one of the first tribes to defeat the US military. And because of that, forced the US government to sign the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868. And that treaty effectively said that as the US advanced West, as the need for more resources and more land and the gold rush and whatever the case might have been, that as US soldiers and residents kept pushing to the West that they would leave the Lakota alone. You know, if you look at a map of where indigenous communities are now in the United States and draw a line to where they historically come from, it, it looks like an asterisk, right? So many different communities have been forced marched across the country like in the Trail of Tears, and many tribes have been completely relocated from their historic homelands. The Lakota have always occupied this part of the Americas. This, this is where their creation myth takes place. This is where they believe they come from. They are very rooted to this land. And as with the nearly 500 treaties that the US government has signed throughout the course of American history with other native tribes, they violated this treaty not long after it was signed and they discovered there was a lot of gold in the Black Hills. And so if you all remember reading about Wounded Knee and what happened there, you know, General Custer came with more soldiers and there was a massacre and 300 Lakota men, women and children were murdered. That part of the country was turned into a national park, which has long been a tool of land theft from indigenous people. And a hundred years later, the Lakota came back to the US government and said, hey, you broke the law. We signed this document, we signed this treaty and it's not really our system of government, but it's your legal system and, and we signed it and you violated it, so we're going to sue you. And that court case made its way up to the US Supreme Court and, and I'm completely blanking on the year. I believe it was 1980, but I'm, I'm going to fact check myself because I can't remember now. But in 1980, the US Supreme Court said, you know, you, you, you're absolutely right. We're so sorry. We stole your land. We broke the treaty. Here's, here's some money. And the Lakota went, well, but no, we, we, don't, we don't want money. We're, we're looking for our land back. We want our, again, this is, this is where our ancestors come from. This is, we have all of these creation myths that take place in the Black Hills. Just give us the land back. That's all we're asking for, not, not money. And of course the US government said, well, but we can't really start that process because if we give you land back, then we have to give the Passamaquoddy land back and we have to, you know, we, we have to start this process with every other tribe and we can't, we can't set that precedent. So, so here's some money, please take it. And the Lakota refused. And so that money has sat in an interest bearing bank account in escrow since 1980. It is now, I believe, worth about $1.3 billion, which would make it, in theory, the largest 
US government payout in our history were it to be paid out. But periodically they go back to the Lakota and say, please, please just accept this. And the Lakota go, absolutely not. We just don't expect this. That's all we're asking for. And so what I always ask people to think about in the context of all of these stories is who is responsible for telling our history? Who is responsible for recording and documenting our stories? Why is it that for so many young people in the United States, their first associations with indigenous people are Pocahontas or Christopher Columbus and Thanksgiving? Why aren't they stories of ongoing injustice like the boarding schools or why aren't they stories of resistance like Standing Rock? And you know, unfortunately, ultimately it was not successful, but for five months, you know, nearly 10,000 people came from around the world to, to stand with the Lakota and Standing Rock and say, absolutely not. This is completely unjust to build this pipeline. So I think it's our collective responsibility as Americans to question who is responsible for telling our stories? Who is responsible for the stories and images that appear in our newspapers? Who's responsible for putting together our textbooks? Who's responsible for the films and the books that we consume? Because for such a long time, we have had a singular understanding and perspective on who we are. And there is nothing wrong with a white, male, cisgender, heterosexual perspective on the world. But if it is the only perspective that we are allowed to consume on the world, that becomes dangerous. That, that becomes a real problem. So you know, I, I, think, I think it is our collective responsibility to make sure that for our children, for next generations, that we are fixing this, that we are making sure to be more inclusive in who we bring in and who we nurture and who we teach, especially in the storytelling community, because we have such a rare opportunity and privilege as documentary photographers, as photojournalists, to allow the world to see what we see. And that's, that's something that I think we need to seriously consider how we can improve and how we can broaden the perspectives that we're all sharing. So thank you very much. I'm gonna cut myself off there. And I think we now have some time for questions. Thank if you I very can. much, Daniela. Um, uh, if you have questions and, and you wanna just chat, put them in the chat box, Michelle will, um, Michelle will, uh, uh, send them through. And then if you want to raise your hand and ask Daniela um, a question, I'll just unmute you um, when uh, when you put your hand up. So I'm going to just keep scrolling through names. And, and if somebody wants to ask Daniela a question, please um, uh, raise your hand and I will unmute you, if that's OK. Um, Okay, Julian. Julian. Yes. Did you have a question? No, just a comment okay. about the movie. It was very good. <laughs> it's, I, I would recommend anyone who's looking for a nonfiction uh, story about Canadian boarding schools. Um, it's a movie called Rhymes for Young Ghouls by a, a Mi'kmaq filmmaker named uh, Jeff Barnaby. It's incredible. OK. Um, Grace. Uh, sorry. Grace, do you have a question? Yeah, uh-huh. I saw um, something on 60 Minutes actually years ago about the Indian boarding schools. And the ones that I, I saw were uh, it's all presented were Catholic schools. Are a lot of these Catholic schools? Yes, I'm sorry that I forgot that in my spiel. So in Canada, the schools were entirely funded by the Canadian government and they were all administered either by the Catholic, the Anglican or the Presbyterian church. Um, so they were essentially run with government funding but with no government oversight. Um, in the United States, because of separation of church and state, we couldn't do that. So we actually had two separately evolved systems. Uh, one was public, Bureau of Indian Education uh, boarding schools. And then also um, there were a lot of private boarding schools that were created by largely Catholic uh, missionaries, um, mostly Jesuit. Um, and many reservations had both a government boarding school and, and a private Catholic boarding school. And a lot of them still exist today. And they were terrible. <clears throat> they were and some continue to be terrible. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know? Yeah, hi, thanks, Lori. Um, Daniela, the, the portraits are absolutely beautiful. They're stunning, really. Um, 
just everything about them. They're really moving. Um, I, I'm I'm relatively familiar with the boarding school system in uh, Canada, and you know, and and what happened here. But um, my question for you is, uh, you know, in your approach to talking with um, the uh, native peoples, um, what did you run into any um, issues around not being native? I'm making an assumption that you're not native. Um, uh, it, you can, if you can clarify, um, confirm that, and just like, and how do you, and how do you feel about that? About about um, going in and not being part of the community, yet photographing them and doing something so intense and 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 has that has so much depth as this project does. Um, I think it's a really important question uh, that comes up a lot. Uh, so I'm not indigenous. I am uh, half Vietnamese, and I'm of Eastern European Jewish ancestry. Um, and ironically, I think that actually often put people, you know, even though I am an outsider and was clearly an outsider in all of these communities, I think when I explained my background, often the reaction was, oh, so you're Vietnamese, you're Jewish, you understand sort of a, a collective history of genocide, you understand, you know, trauma and what that means in sort of in your background, in your family history. Um, but, I, but yeah, I, categorically, I'm an outsider and there are a lot of problems with being a non-Indigenous person documenting Indigenous communities because you know, the, the group we have most marginalized and silenced um, in American history. So you know, I, I try to be as transparent and open about that as possible, both with the people who are kind enough to give me their time and speak with me, um, and also just in, in the process of publishing my work. It's, yeah, it's, we, we need more Indigenous storytellers, um, and we need to be empowering and lifting up more Indigenous storytellers. So, you know, yeah, I, I think my, my situation, my work is far from perfect, but I also do believe in the work and I believe in sharing this history with people. Thank you. Victoria, you had a question? Yes. Hi, Danielle. Um, I have a question. Have you kept in touch with um, the family that we had first uh, seen photographs of? And if you can share like what they're up to now, as well as um, the people that you took the portraits of? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the gentleman whose portrait I shared, who had the cross in his forehead and had that experience with the, the potential nerve gas, he's become uh, one of my closest friends. And so I talk to him on a, a probably a daily basis. Um, and he works in the community. Uh, and he was responsible for connecting me to a lot of the people who are, are in my book and in this project from the Canadian chapter. Um, I am on and off again in touch with Ellie, depending on her access to technology. I, I don't always have a direct line to her, but when I do, I, I've gone back to test that one about once a year since I first worked on the project. And so I, at the very least, know where her aunt lives and can always like check in on people in person that way. Um, so that's, that's really important to me, being able to stay in touch and not just be someone who comes in and works on a story and you know, parachutes back out and then never corresponds with those individuals again. I, I try to constantly be checking in. Um, I don't know if there's any like relevant personal information, like updates I can share about the family, but but so far um, everyone is doing well. The only, uh, Mike Pinay, the first portrait I shared of the gentleman with the hat, he unfortunately passed away about two years ago, <clears throat> but everyone else is doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else, I'm scrolling, just looking for hands. I think someone with the account My Files is raising her hand in her video window. Okay, My Files. I got it, okay. Hi, My oh. Files. Am I on? Yes. Okay, um, first of all, I wanna just tell you, I just think your work is heartbreaking moving and incredibly beautiful at the same time, which I think Thank is you. one of the challenges when you're trying to do something that's documentary and about a painful subject, but to make people actually want to look at it as well as be moved by it. So yeah, just really, really great. Um, but my question is this, I was wondering, did you get the official pushback at all when you were trying to do research to find uh, other images to layer with the portraits and so on, because um, 
I mean, I know in America, it's, there's a, it's really difficult to do that sort of work where you're trying to actually bring out records that people do not want to know about. I mean, I grew up in New Orleans and we're still struggling there with our horrible um, history with, with slavery and also with uh, indigenous peoples, particularly down south of Louisiana, in the southern Louisiana. So I'm just curious, did you ever face people actually trying to shut it down or scare you off or anything like that? Or were they allowed uh, to do your research without encumbrance? Do you mean institutionally or from I mean, the government? Institutionally, you know, it, because a lot of times, you know, it just seems that they want to bury. I had heard about this. I mean, I had read about these these Indian schools and so on. Um, but it seems a lot of times that once they've sort of they've closed it and they stopped, they don't want to. Um, they don't want people digging it up again. I mean, we're still battling in in the South with having getting rid of Confederate memorials for good. Right. So. Uh, yeah. And as is Canada, um, in, in people who are actually responsible for uh, engineering the school system. Um, you know, I, I did not experience any kind of pushback. I was also, when I started working on this project in 2014, 2015, it was before Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission had completed. So at the time, I would say on average in Canada, the white people I was encountering had never heard of residential schools. And I think that's not the case now. I think every single Canadian more or less knows what they are because of this TRC that spanned uh, six or seven years and was quite publicly broadcast. Um, but at the time it was, it really felt like, especially in Saskatchewan, um, I was talking, people were talking to me and sharing memories and stories that they had never spoken about before, that they hadn't told their children about, that they, so it, it it felt like this was all, like in that moment, it felt like a lot of this was coming to light. Um, in the US, I think partially because many of the schools that once existed are now military sites because they're, you know, on US government property and have been converted into like military bombing sites in Oklahoma or military barracks in Pennsylvania. I, I have a lot more trouble accessing the things I need to photograph in the United States um, because of those restrictions. And so I, you know, I had to go through a background check to get onto the grounds of Carlisle to photograph the cemetery there. Mm. Um, but in Canada, I, I experienced almost no pushback, partially because I was only working in indigenous communities and was only really interested in the perspective of indigenous people. So I was either in on reserves in indigenous communities in urban settings or looking at sort of the decaying remnants of these schools, which were not exactly closely guarded. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm. Um, I have a question from Rachel Wisniewski. Um, she writes, have you heard from the people that you photographed how they feel about their double exposure portraits? She's wondering if they think they look cool or don't really get it, the double exposure part, but are still happy to help out or anything else. So uh, after I had made them, but before I published, I published a book in 2017 of the work uh, through photo evidence. And I think my, my book editor is actually on, uh, on the Zoom call. Um, I, before I uh, designed the book, I went back to Saskatchewan with prints of all of the images and went and saw every single person in person to say, look, is, like this, this is the way in which I'm presenting this. This is the interview excerpts that I would like to present along with it. Or like, are you still comfortable with all these things? I think there was, of the 25 people I wanted to include in the book, there was one person who said, it's not, I, I'm, I'm in a different place in my life than I was when I met you two years ago. I don't think about or have these memories be public anymore. Um, but visually, I think people really understood and connected to it. Um, and you know, my my goal in using the composites was to say, look, this, you know, this is this is a story about memory. This is a story about the things that we pass on generationally from parent to child that stay with us, even though we don't have those experiences ourselves. And so I think I I, I really I didn't have to explain literally or figuratively what I was doing. I think people actually can um, in mid sense of them. Um, whoever, if I've unmuted you and you haven't, and I didn't mute you back, um, it would be helpful if you did mute yourself back. Um, we have a question from Ron. Yeah, let me. Hey, Ron. Oh, wait. Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> 
Hang on. Wait. Okay, try it again. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, um, not too far from the Sequoia Indian School. Uh, I don't know if you researched that or not, but um, I mean, I, you know, we played them in, in sports and I grew up, you know, know, knowing more about, I mean, I'm African American. I grew up knowing more about um, Native American history than I did African American history. I mean, hmm. that's, what they, that's what we were taught in school. And I never, I, you know, I mean, I knew, I knew Sequoia was a boarding school, but I didn't know if, if it had a, had a checkered past or not. Have you done any research on that? So, so, quite, uh, so I don't know. I was in Oklahoma uh, about a year ago. Um, I'm just looking up where in the state it is. Sequoia. Yeah, it's, it's in Tahlequah, which is the Cherokee Nation. It's the home of the, it's the. Um, so I, you know what, um, you feel, please feel free to reach out to me over email and I, I would love to dig in a little more. I'm sure I have something on it. I just can't recall. I was mostly looking at, uh, and I'm currently, hold on, I'm just going to look because this is embarrassing. They're the largest and one of the first Indian boarding schools in the United States was in Oklahoma. Yeah, um, this, this was, um, actually I, I was, as you were talking, I was looking at it on Wikipedia and there's, I mean, they, they, they talk about it being a Bureau of Indian Affairs school and uh, funded by Bureau, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. It doesn't go into much of the history. And I'm, now I'm really curious about it because, um, you know, it was something that we, I went to school in, in Tahlequah at Northeastern Oklahoma State there. And I would drive by the school every, you know, week. And um, it's a beautiful school. I mean, it's, you know, the, I just remember all the buildings being white and it just kind of sits up on a hill. Um, but now I'm sort of drawing comparisons to that in Carlisle, you know? Yeah. And um, I mean, many, many of them were beautiful campuses. And I think, especially in Canada, but I've noticed this in the U.S. too. I mean, they, they were all built off of a very similar blueprint. A lot of them have these very long tree-lined driveways right, that lead up exactly. to brick buildings. Yeah, they're, they're beautiful campuses. But, you know, up, up until quite late in our history, they were, they were all, especially BIA schools, were really terrible places. But I'd, I'd be interested to look more into the that yeah, specific like school. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, if the if um, Danielle, if your book editor is still on, I would love for that person to drop a link for the book in the chat box, please. Uh, so she is. She's still here. Unfortunately, the book is completely sold out. Um, I can actually very quickly show everyone a video. I forgot to do that. If I can still share my screen. Let's hope so. Um, I can just show you what the book looks like. It was a huge labor of love and I would not have been able to do it without Regina. Um, but we, uh, we decided that it was really important. I, you know, the double exposure, the composite is obviously the sort of main product of this project, but it also in some ways felt like erasure because with many of them, you couldn't actually read the, the faces of the individuals uh, who I'd interviewed. And so we created these transparent overlays with each portrait so that you could both see the person and then, and then see the composite underneath. Um, we did a run of about 750, I believe, of these through a publisher called Photo Evidence that focuses on uh, social justice photojournalism. Um, and we, uh, the Pulitzer Center, the nonprofit that funds a lot of my work, uh, bought out about half of the print run and we sent them to middle schools and high schools in Canada and the US to be used as teaching tools because at the time there were very little educational resources around boarding schools. How many, how many did you print? I think 750. Okay. Sort of a standard photo book run. Unfortunately, they're so expensive to print. Um, I have a question. For, um, did you, did you, do you have a preconceived idea of natives before you started this project? And if so, how did it influence the way you approached this project in the very beginning? What made you look at your first project and realize it wasn't ethical to publish? Um, I, I truthfully didn't because I, I grew up in Washington, DC and then lived in New York, London and Paris. You know, I had very little engagement with indigenous history, culture, identity as a child, other than the fact that my local football team was named after a racial slur. Um, I'll stop sharing that. Uh, so no, I, you know, it, it was an incredibly steep learning curve of 
knowing how, how to use the right language, how to be respectful, what things I could and could not photograph. Um, so I, I came in with basically no pre-existing knowledge and luckily had a lot of very kind, very patient people who would say, nope, no, nope, you can't photograph that. Nope, you can't say that. Please, please use this word instead. And I am so grateful to those people who were patient and kind with me. Um, but no, I, I, I don't, I mean, probably in a good way as well, I, I had zero preconceived notions of what, of what indigenous history culture meant. Um, so I, I was learning as I went along and luckily I almost exclusively was learning from indigenous people. So there's three minutes left. Um, thank you very, very much, Daniela. It's, it's incredibly moving work and um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I, 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 the pain of it is um, extraordinary and um, the beauty that you were able to um, uh, convey, um, I'm, I'm very grateful, thank you. And um, I do, before we leave, I do want to talk about we, Women Photograph and the fundraising campaign that you are currently embarking on. Um, Daniela, as I said earlier, founded Women Photograph, and they have already distributed $30,000 uh, of money that they raised to 73 photographers critically in need of support since COVID-19 um, basically shut down so many people's practice. Uh, so I'd like for you to spend time talking a little bit about the women that you're supporting and, and, your, and please make your call for support. Sure. Uh, so I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called Women Photograph that's uh, working to elevate the voices of women and non-binary visual journalists. So uh, roughly 15, 1-5% of working news photographers are women and, um, you know, connected to my whole spiel about making sure that we're being inclusive and who's responsible for telling our story when we largely look at news and politics and sports and fashion through the lens of the male experience that that deeply impacts how we understand our world. So um, Women Photograph was started as a database, as a hiring resource effectively for photo editors and curators and art directors. Um, and we now have a community of more than a thousand independent women photographers based in about 115 countries around the world. Um, and all of us are independent and our, you know, our income streams have dried up uh, essentially overnight. Um, so we uh, launched the first round of our emergency fund. And in five days, I think we got um, over a thousand applications from people who were primary breadwinners for their households who had lost all income, people who were pregnant, single mothers, people who were caretaking for elderly parents, um, a lot of people who were responsible for others, sort of a theme. You know, we had tons of students and photographers who were on assignment who got stranded in other countries and weren't able to work and weren't able to get home. Um, people who were just, you know, at either homeless or about to lose homes. Um, so just incredibly critical need across the board from almost everyone in our community. Uh, I surveyed our membership um, at the very beginning, like really before things had gotten very bad. Um, and 96% of our members said that they had already been financially impacted and 45% of people said they were in a critical situation. So, um, you know, for anyone who has stable income right now and feels like they are secure enough to be able to donate to help out uh, independent photographers, I will post a link. Oh, and Lori did, and then I will share. So the donate link is, um, if I can spell... Um, you can read more about the emergency fund at that link and then you can donate at the link below um, if you have capacity. So thank you so much for tuning in and listening. It was really lovely to see your faces and connect with all of you.